So welcome everyone to uh, season two, episode two of People, Passion and Purpose podcast. Or uh, in other words, it's uh, Harate with Pungi. So the idea with this podcast is to bring uh, genuine voices, uh, discover voices that are, uh, you know, really wanting to move up uh, and really reach people. So with that background in mind, I have very two uh, two very interesting people here, uh, Ramesh and Devi, uh, who I'll be introducing in in a, just a little bit. But the story behind getting them here is uh, actually a LinkedIn post uh, that I saw. And uh, it really resonated with me in terms of sustainability and, uh, and, and a lot of things that I personally believe in. So a quick call to uh, a post on, uh, a comment on their post. And then a quick conversation, and here we are five days uh, after we've known each other, uh, literally. Uh, so some of the things that fascinated me was that uh, they've been in uh, operation as a as an organization for seven plus years, and uh, they've touched lakhs of lives, basically giving awareness and basically propagating safe, chemical-free, organic whole foods uh, to people. They've supported uh, hundreds of organic farmers and farmer groups, uh, you know, with uh, decent prices and buying a lot of organic produce from them and enabling, uh, you know, individuals like me and you to actually have access to it. And there are a lot of other points, uh, but then I'll, uh, you know, put a, a spotlight on Ramesh and Devi. So the organization we're talking about is called BioBasics. They're based in Coimbatore. And uh, we have these uh, two very amazing evangelists of sustainability and whole foods uh, here. So over to you guys, uh, you know. No, thanks, Sunil. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, uh, really nice to see youngsters getting into this, talking about this. I just wish there were more and more youngsters talking about sustainability, particularly when it comes to our food and our personal lifestyle. Uh, this is the way to go. And uh, we are, like you, like I said earlier, we are shamelessly evangelical about this. So we want to bring in as many people uh, into this lifestyle as possible. Dave, you want yeah. to? I mean, I, I'm normally not this silent, but uh, my throat is not coming back up <laughs> a small infection I've had. <laughs> so I think I let Ramesh uh, enter stage for most of today. <laughs> okay, that should that's, be. And that's very unusual, huh? <laughs> it's an opportunity after a long time. Actually, <laughs> so I think uh, first things first. Uh, uh, how what 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 uh, motivated you to actually get in uh, and start something uh, like like BioBasics? Right. On the same note, I uh, we started it because uh, you know I decided to follow my wife's footsteps, uh, <laughs> but that's on the, uh, the in a lighter way. But jokes aside. Uh, the reason why we got into this was kind of our own personal uh, experiences. And uh, in incidentally, it happened in the US. Uh, while I was working at a corporate job, I had some health setbacks, wanted to look at what I am eating and how, why did it, that happen? Because I was a vegetarian all through and I was very careful about my food. But after two years of student life in the US, uh, things possibly went wrong and we were in a different country with a different uh, food system. So, uh, so mm -hmm. I, I did have a, a health setback and then we started looking at why that happened. So that was an education. Uh, and in the meantime, Devi, you can talk about what changed, uh, what brought you here into. Yeah, I think for me, when uh, we moved to the US, one of the things we, uh, the enormous amount of obesity that we saw around there. I mean, I moved to US thinking that it's a first world country. They've figured it all out. And then we found that on one hand, food was extremely cheap, the processed food. On the other hand, there was so much obesity. And then I, you know, started looking into it. I was doing a master's then. Also looked and found that it was food that was the problem. I mean, we were just eating a tremendous amount of processed food, which was made available cheap, and we were not eating real food. And uh, I was personally planning to work on water issues and this kind of turned my focus into food. And I started working with an organic farming group there. We personally went organic in 2005. And uh, from then, you know, moved on to working with farmers in India. I mean, which I've been doing for now uh, about 17 years. Uh, and one thing led to another. 
so worked on a project for conservation of traditional rice varieties uh, for over uh, 10 to 12 years so which we got into curation of uh, heritage grains seed diversity uh, worked on uh, the uh, campaign uh, to keep india free of gm food so i was very much involved in the bt campaign in 2008 to 10 so the whole thing segued uh, into you know food being you know we felt it was all the farming part the food part health everything is interconnected and so i was uh, leading essentially a double life right so i was going to my office uh, dealing with uh, you know high finance and wall street and things like that. and then uh, in the evening i would come back and and we'll watch documentaries on genetic modification of food uh, which which is which is a turning point for me and there are so many other documentaries about the food food system etc which i would watch so it was literally on one hand i was doing the corporate on the hand i was educating myself thanks to devi on all these aspects it's shocking so at some point I, I wanted to start a social i wanted to both of us actually wanted to work in the social field for a long time but okay coming from middle class we we had to hold a job so we did uh, and we had a son to bring up so all that was there mm -hmm. so at some point in 13 i decided to quit uh, my corporate life and uh, and returned back to india uh, and that time we were working in netherlands so we came back and uh, we said, okay, let's start working on uh, building a social enterprise of some kind, and particularly in the area of sustainable food. So that's when, and uh, in fact, Devi was already 2007 onwards, we had a farm uh, in Polachi, which is near Coimbatore. So we, when we came back, we were very idealistic. We, uh, we used bicycles like they would in Netherlands, and we tried to kind of, you know, uh, farm. On this farm and live without a car and we lived without a car we used to catch three buses to go to the farm so imagine i'm just it's just a shock right you're coming from netherlands and the us come down to bolaji and kind of catching these buses i started wearing a veshti at that time because i i didn't know how to wear a veshti until then so it was a whole transformation which happened then me going in a veshti in a bus three buses from Coimbatore to this farm in bolaji and we were doing farming there okay so we rented a place in the village. We started farming there because Devi wanted to do organic farming and I had no clue of what farming was. So we started doing that and uh, you know some of the farmers we met, we met a lot of farmer leaders also at that time. We traveled to Hyderabad and uh, Pune and other places, met a lot of these guys. And one of the things that came out was, look, you, you don't need to do farming yourself. Mm. The problem is much bigger than that. And you farming five acres, very organic farming and all that is not going to move the needle. What the farmers today need is a market for what they produce already. So we have the largest community of organic in the world today. We have about 8 lakh farmers in India. Wow. And uh, a big chunk of that is being exported today. It is not coming to the domestic market. And because the, the demand for organic food or whole foods is is lagging behind and the supply is way ahead and unlike people what people think you know that uh, it's not available it's not easy to get it's it's quite the contrary it's very easy to get there is enough and more uh, organic uh, farmers producing a lot of good quality for organic wanting to produce more uh, and these very farmers are producing more their neighboring farmers are also looking to kind of join the bandwagon but the demand is not there so imagine a farmer who is organic, who is producing, say, tomatoes, and he finds that half his produce has to be given at the regular prices to the regular wholesalers, whereas the other half is going at a much higher price to genuine, conscious, uh, discerning customers like, like us who want to eat safe food. So it becomes a problem. So people say, okay, there is no market. So that is where we felt that, and somebody said that, please create a market for us. One of the farmer leaders we, we know, Sundaraman Ayya, uh, he is based out of Satya Mangalam. And he said, look, don't waste your time on trying to farm yourself. Uh, you uh, need to create the market. And when we looked at the whole market situation, we realized that the customer is uh, the problem because she is not buying as much of organic food as she should. But she's also the solution to the entire thing. So if she starts going organic, then the farmers start producing organic, the government regulations and 
other policies will fall in place. The businesses will start coming up supporting that whole demand. And we've seen that happen in, in US and Europe also, where the consumers demand that I want this and the whole thing changes. So uh, there are many examples there that I can quote. But that's that's what drove us to start Biobasics as, a, as an organization which is committed to creating that market for the organic farmers. Mm. So the intention is not to produce our own stuff and then sell. The intention is to source it, sincerely source it from genuine organic farmers across the country and make it available to organic consumers across the country, but with trying to tell them also why and how and what of organic. Mm. So there's a lot of education that needs to be done. And that's what I think Biobasics is very different from a lot of other organic players. Spend a lot of time talking to consumers. So you would think that we are more of a farmer-driven organization. We are farmer-driven, but we are very consumer-focused. We want to kind of, because we find that consumers are the solution to this whole problem. If they demand it, then it'll happen. So yeah. that's why we are evangelists. <laughs> I think when you said, uh, you know, the consumers are uh, basically be the ones that can actually change the scenario. So one of the first things that came to my mind was uh, there was this ad on Discovery very, very long back when I, when I was uh, a very young kid. So it said when the buying stops, the killing will. It, it was uh, exactly. about exactly. shark fin soup. Uh, that exactly. was, popular in many places yeah it's, but when it's the buying different. starts the <laughs> uh, the chains will so especially yes. when farming the same thing i mean as uh, one of the focus areas in biobasics is traditional grains heritage grains since i've worked on these uh, projects conserving uh, heritage grains we carry a lot of uh, you know rices wheats uh, you won't believe we have about 60 kinds of rice 10 kinds of wheat uh, so we, uh, I keep saying, you know, one of the things, uh, how do you, I mean, we always say when it comes to conservation that, you know, be it forest, be it animals, wild animals, leave them for conservation. And I keep saying when it comes to agrobiodiversity or by biodiversity in the fields, you have to consume to conserve. So only if you eat these traditional varieties of, you know, grains, the farmers are going to grow more of it. And only then they're going to last. Many of them climate resilient many of them which we are going to need in the future. So, I mean, exactly like you said, here the buying and the consuming has to start the right kind of buying and the right kind of consuming. Yeah, and uh, yeah, very, very uh, in interesting thought because, uh, you know, uh, when, when I saw your LinkedIn post and then after, uh, I mean, in, uh, here I, I, uh, I've been somebody who's supporting, uh, say, Understanding where our products are coming, especially in terms of, you know, plastic, uh, how we reduce our footprints and all of that. Uh, but I was surprised uh, that I don't know where my food is coming from. And uh, my mom's a kindergarten teacher and uh, she'd asked her kids, where do you get milk? And they'd said, uh, some uncle will come and deliver. <laughs> and that, that was it. So our uh, focus as a consumer is, is so uh, out of focus. That we don't know where it is coming from, what what's happening, where is it? Uh, but how do you see this situation in terms of uh, you know your awareness campaigns or you you talking to people? What's the pulse of of the people that uh, you have seen? Yeah, so completely agree with you. I think the uh, the sociological term is alienation. Uh, all of us are completely alienated from farming, from rural <clears throat> life from the reality of the food system completely alienated. and the way uh, like like you rightly said there are some cases where i'm told that school children were asked where rice comes from and they said that it it grows on trees or whatever <laughs> so it kind of it's a very very different and i and it's a it's it's not like we know everything okay yesterday for example we were in uh, we we're visiting a farm of a farmer who produces nutmeg mm -hmm. i have not had nutmeg in my life myself but this is the spice that brought the Europeans back to India. This is what caused all those wars. So, and we don't know what nutmeg is. It's very, it's a fantastic spice, very expensive, but uh, we don't know that. I didn't know that. Similarly, I didn't know that there were 10 varieties of wheat. <laughs> and today we are offering 10 varieties. Oh, wow. 
right? So it's very true. But to answer your question as to how the consumer, the consumers are interested in knowing more about where the food is, at least the ones who are interested. Uh, but you know there are quite a few consumers who could care less. They could just say that, well, I don't care. I just eat what I what I get. There's a lot of cavalier yeah. attitude yeah. there uh, that I eat what I do. But uh, I'm sure uh, as they grow older, so essentially, you know, uh, folks in probably your age group uh, don't cook. They don't they don't particularly care about food. Food is just fun. And so I mean, you're one of those exceptions. I would say that who likes to kind of think about. Uh, where it comes from and it's a very very profound question so uh, so it depends on the which age group it is and then what we have seen is uh, when the consumers when the, when the families when they start their first uh, with their first child that is when the thing clicks mm -hmm. so that's when they say okay here's my boy or a girl and I want to give her the best and uh, what is the best food that I can give her that is the starting point so until then, they don't care. You know, they're in the fun part, they're eating here, doing swiggy, zomato, whatever. But that is when they start thinking, okay, I need to think about what should I give my child? And that changes. The other trigger that I've seen is when people actually fall sick. Mm -hmm. And that was me, right? So until then, I didn't personally, I didn't particularly care about where my food, I mean, it's great you're asking that question at this age. At 35, I was not asking that question. And only when I had this whole cholesterol issue and all that, I said, okay, uh, what am I eating? Right? So health is a trigger where people start thinking about uh, mm -hmm. about food. And there are, of course, a very few uh, and the segments, if you see, there are folks who are interested in the farmer welfare. Right? So they want to, and this farmer agitations have been going, people have been talking about it. There are these suicides which have happened. So people are uh, concerned about, I mean, the socially conscious folks, they're concerned about are the farmers getting their right share? Um, but, and then of course, the environmental aspects of it. So there are these two to three triggers we have seen among consumers. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Dave, you want to add something? <laughs> yeah, I think very, like, uh, very generic question from my end uh, was that what's the pulse? Uh, and, uh, you know, rightly, in direction, it's about uh, a lot of us have to have an event that basically jars us in the face and say, okay, now what? And that's when it basically moves. Uh, because that I was really uh, interested to learn about, uh, you know, your awareness activities, because once people become aware, then it's a thought process that's put, that's basically a seed that's put in, uh, you know, uh, the organic seed that is put in their uh, uh, minds. So how's that journey and what's been your biggest challenge? Yeah, so we've started when right from beginning, we felt that consumer education and at some level, I don't want to even call it education because that seems a little pedantic. So I, what we want to say is, okay, we want to share what we know, right? And you think about it yourself. And if it makes sense to you, you know, we are here to help you. So that's the approach we have taken. So what we have done is right from beginning when we started, uh, we used to actually reach out to residential associations and rotary club and schools and colleges and even hospitals where the doctors would get together and we have done quite a few of these face-to-face -face, in person offline kind of uh, sessions called know your food <clears throat> where we basically talk about what's in your food right now how is it impacting your and how can you change it and therefore how can you go organic so there are many of these uh, sessions i think we would have conducted close to I don't know, close to 100 such sessions across oh, wow. the last seven years, talking to various people. Uh, and uh, if you talk to 100 people, you know, 10 people would want to know more. So remember, the 90 people are kind of like not switched <laughs> off. They know it is important, but that's not their priority. Because that, like you said, that whole trigger has not happened. So when that trigger happens, then it, it, it works. So around 10 people will be interested and they'll try it out and then we'll have maybe five or six of them who will actually come in and buy and continue to buy from uh, BioBasics and go organic. That's more important. So this whole education is, that's how it started. Then once the uh, social media came along, then Devi has been taking an active role in making these things popular on Instagram and uh, Facebook. And we did some sessions on uh, Zoom sessions, bringing in some experts. We talked about how it affects health, what do you do 
with millets and with rice and things like that. So it's kind of those sessions are also there on our YouTube channel. So that helps. So in effect, we have been trying to, uh, we are not the social media generation, but uh, but we are uh, willy-nilly uh, becoming, uh, willy-nilly forced to get into social media. We are not very good at it. Uh, but we're trying to get there. We're trying to kind of uh, get the word out. If social, see for us, that's what I keep saying. You know, this for me, it's a means. The end is that we need to get people convinced about going sustainable on, on food. So if it if, if it means uh, Facebook or Instagram, so be it. If it means YouTube and Pinterest, so be it. So I'm I'm kind of uh, you know kind of a little uh, agnostic towards which medium we use. Idea is that the, the word has to get around, get get out. Yeah, I think uh, like pra, you know, considering that I have been a part of uh, the social media uh, revolution ever since the beginning, uh, cross posting or basically the medium doesn't matter if you have a real voice to share, and and genuine voices uh, need I think all sorts of uh, encouragement and motivation to say, okay, you know, we are jumping in this bandwagon and going where it goes. Right. Very interesting uh, points that you shared. Uh, you know, when you said sustainability coming into picture, uh, and uh, you know, just this, this this question to Devi say, uh, you know, you say indigenous or you know your uh, naturally the uh, endemic uh, rice species or basically rice uh, this thing. So, how how much of research actually is going into it actually? Because uh, you know, I only know basmati rice. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, what is interesting is this whole thing, uh, part of the organic farming movement has been a lot of farmers, farming uh, groups associated with organic farming, finding that we have a lot of traditional varieties which have gone out of vogue. The whole green revolution focus on only yield and also to keep it market friendly. So they just want these three rices to sell. You want soda masuri, you want baspati, you want a single, uh, you know, column table rice and maybe an idli rice because the whole market is geared towards large scale production <clears throat> you uh, you take it mill it in large scale and supply it so all these uh, various varieties that we had just went out of work because the farm, there was no takers the farmers wanted to sell to the mainstream where the big mills what they take from them is what they sell so as part of the organic farming movement we started looking at all these varieties i mean we certain uh, one of the NGOs that I was part of and we found that the farmers had these seeds some of them remember their grandparents farming it they had some little bit of seeds and India is one of the centers of origin of rice which means that there are these global centers of origin for every crop and India is one of the centers of origin which means one of the largest diversity of rice varieties would be found in the Indian subcontinent and you know even in 1960 or 70 uh, one of the rice scientists had documented more than 20,000 varieties. Wow. <laughs> and we are supposed to have more than 100,000. This is 20,000 was documented in the 1960s and 70s. And with this project that we were involved in, we uh, started, you know, farmers started conserving. And in these initiatives itself, I think we uh, there are over 1,000 varieties conserved. That doesn't mean all the varieties come into the market as food because you need this diversity to provide a robust, robust gene pool also. You know, certain traits get picked up from one variety to another. You find what is good. So there are varieties that farmers like because they withstand uh, drought, something else withstands flood, something else is very good in terms of taste. So various reasons. Uh, whereas modern farming is all about only yield, which what, I mean, they're not looking at any other factor. And so rice also becomes a commodity. Nobody's bothered about, you know. So it's polished, made into this one slender grain and we all eat it. <laughs> so we are not looking at any other attribute of the rice. I keep saying rice has become like uh, what restaurants say. They give you this nice elaborate menu where they describe everything. You know, this has this in it. It will be, uh, you know, butter fried uh, capsicum into which we put this thick gravy. And then at the bottom of the page, we say, comes with a bowl of steamed rice. <laughs> So that's what we have uh, reduced Reduce rice to. You know, comes with a bowl of steamed rice. Nobody's, you know, talks about how it is cooked, how it is grown, what it is, nothing. Whereas when you start eating these indigenous varieties, that rice in itself has a particular taste, a particular look. 
and uh, micronutrients which are different. Each variety has different micronutrients. All that we have just reduced it to, you know, a commodity at the rate level and the food level. And now we have also made rice the enemy. Exactly. <laughs> saying obesity is because of rice. Diabetes is Very because right. of rice. So what we did is we just reduced a beautiful, fantastic food crop which feeds half of mankind or humankind into a commodity which can be easily transported, which can be easily stored. Why do we polish rice? Because if you polish it, it will not get infestation. So we take away all the brand of work make it an easily transportable uh, commodity with a huge shelf life, which is in no way good for us. And then we vilify it. <laughs> so we have destroyed it. And now we say, oh no, don't touch rice. I don't eat rice. The dietitian says don't eat rice. The doctor says don't eat rice. And then what do we do? We eat healthy snacks. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we're perpetually hungry. <laughs> It, it, it's, uh, you know, it's a systemic way of, of destroying something that was, you know, actually very, very uh, uh, yeah. proper for us uh, and in, in, in the right, right amount. So, you exactly. know, yeah, doctors are saying, like, you, you have to reduce your, uh, you know, uh, rice intake, go on, go, go crazy on millets, <laughs> go crazy with ragi. Uh, and then everybody now shuns uh, rice and uh, I think for me, generally, you know, this discussion has been quite uh, quite an eye opener. I mean, I had read a few books, uh, you know, a few few snippets saying, you know, India is is one of the uh, epicenters of the whole uh, rice revolution, and it, it 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 began very very long ago, and there were like hundreds of species of uh, or you know grains uh, that that we were basically growing, but right now our consumption is limited to only uh, wheat, and then maximum rice, and then you know sometimes uh the you know conscious one get getting into a little draggy uh when the millets came i was like okay where were these uh <laughs> the, where were these things for the last 20 20 30 years I, i'm seeing it for the first time and uh for an average consumer if i am seeing a rice or you know i'm seeing a consumable for the first time in 30 years that's a system that's absolutely flat yeah so we have let even millets i mean a millets we have let it go out of uh, work because of the green revolution on rice. So even areas which didn't have water, we started growing rice. So we kind of, uh, in the process, destroyed the whole thing. Yeah, whole ecosystem. ecosystem in agriculture and which led to the, you know, the messing up of our health. So we stopped growing millets. We st started growing so much rice and made it such a cheap commodity. I keep saying we have to pay more for rice, buy less and eat less of rice, but eat different kinds of rice. I always say pay more, eat less. That's what we need to do. We are all paying less and eating more. That's a, that's a root of our problem. Uh, and that's a, a food wastage angle also. Then. Yeah. Today yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we have enough, only when we have enough to throw away as well. So yeah. when we say food is expensive, every family wants to throw away food. <laughs> that That yeah. is our sense of what affordability of food is all about. Yeah. I think food waste, uh, like when it comes to like farming, uh, consumption and sustainability and the uh, ecosystem, uh, there, are, there are so many things that, uh, you know, have changed. Uh, like go back 20, 20 30 years. Uh, uh, my my great granny was with us by then. And then uh, the exact amount, she's like five people, uh, you could two power rice and that's it. Like everybody is finished. There's hardly anything that goes waste. It goes waste and it goes basically goes back to your garden. Basically, it goes back as manure and comes back. Now, yes. as soon as it go, as soon as it goes out of my plate, I don't. I am not bothered about it. And then, uh, if you go to a restaurant and if you order more than you take it, you bring it home. You at least do one step. But if you are at home, you are eating it, and then you like, I don't feel like eating it. That's it. It it, it ends up in the dustbin. So this waste is factored in when we look at the price of food. We want to be able to buy whether more than what we need. You know, that is, and then we say food is, uh, you know, oh, it should not cost more. It should cost. Should pay the farmer a right price. We should pay for growing food without chemicals. And then we eat only what we need. That's what we need to do. Whereas, like I said, we eat more than we need and we pay less than we should. Uh, question. Yeah, now, 
Sunil, we are also. I'm sorry. Go on, please. Yeah. Uh, do we know what? How how much do we? How much do we need to consume? <laughs> No, we will. If you eat the right kind of food, like we have red rice every day. Mm -hmm. So you just have one cup of rice, you're full. You're full till about 6 p.m. You have a lot of vegetables on the side. You don't have to stay hungry. But suppose the same rice, if you take polished rice, you can eat the three cups of rice very easily. You can eat three times. I mean, when you eat rice with bran, that is which has fiber, you eat almost just half or one third of the white rice. And that is not the right way to eat it. <laughs> and also a mix of grains. I mean, we should be having millets. We should be having wheat. No grain is our enemy. We are our own enemy. We have created everything for convenience. And then we blame the grains. <laughs> now on this, the, the we are trying to run a campaign signal right now, which we'll hopefully la uh, launch in January, where we are saying that, look, if you, are, if you love rice and if you're afraid of rice, Talk to us because we will help you overcome that fear of rice. There is actually something called rhizophobia, fear of rice. I didn't know this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> there is a fear of rice called rhizophobia. <clears throat> so people are afraid of rice. In fact, there are so many people in my own extended family who would refuse to eat rice because they have they've grown up on rice. In fact, each of us, at least in South India, each of us when we start our first solid meal as an infant is rice. There is tradition, there is culture, there is a lot of things associated with rice and there are so many people, like Devi said, you know, half the world population lives on rice. And it's not like half the uh, 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 population is sick, right? There are so many people in Southeast Asia and other places where they're living on rice and there's nothing wrong with it. But it's, a, it's a, what kind of rice you're eating, how are you eating it, how much are you eating, those are the relevant factors. And so... To Devi's point, if you have red rice because of the brine and the fiber, I'll challenge you, you will not be able to eat more. You just can't. Because it fills you up very quickly. Because the fiber, it absorbs moisture and water, it actually bloats up, it will actually fill you up much faster than white polished rice does. So as a result, you eat less. Eat less of rice and more of vegetables, right? So that's the whole logic. So I would invite your uh, listeners, viewers to kind of try that out. Uh, you know, get red rice, preferably from BioBasic. It's an advertisement here. <laughs> but, but get red black rice, brown rice, whatever it is, with rice with fiber and try it out for a week or a month. And then you see the difference. Don't try it out for one meal. You, you will not be satisfied with that. In fact, you will say that no, it's very different because you're used to white rice. You have to get unused to white rice and then start looking. So I would say have a regimen of around 21 days or where you continuously eat the same kind of red rice and then you will start seeing the difference. But you will have to give it about three to four weeks. Mm -hmm. so I can say um, we are so open to, you know, people go to Japanese restaurants. We are going to find Mexican. Mexico. None of us have developed. We didn't grow up with all this. But today we are so open to all this. The same thing applies for eating, you know, traditional grains. We just have to look at it with an open mind, you know, explore how well we can cook it. I mean, there that becomes a difficult chore, whereas going to, uh, trying out Japanese cuisine is easy. <laughs> I mean, it's the mindset. <clears throat> I, I, was, I was about to come to that. Uh, in, in, in effect, uh, you know, we all grew up on rice and basically, you know, like I said, the first thing that we as kids basically do is the uh, Annasantarpana. So we yes. eat that. Uh, and you also mentioned, you know, how easy is it to get to Mexican burritos, you know, Japanese food. Uh, and it still has elements of uh, rice in it and, and, and has different uh, uh, elements of that, that that can be consumed. So how much of a factor is uh, India forgetting its uh, traditional foods playing in, in, in the whole, you know, uh, market of getting everything uh, at once or you know, the mass production of, of rice um, <clears throat> no, I think I mean I would not combine um, I don't know whether I, I understood the question correctly um, I mean was he was he saying that we have forgotten the traditional no, the traditional varieties so I mean our traditional dishes hmm. uh, how much of that is important? In the, in the whole I, I think I'm more flexible. I would say the traditional or modern 
it's what you adopt as a grain. So you can with red rice make kolkate, which is a traditional dish, but you can also make a nice paella, which is a Spanish rice dish. So <laughs> I'm agnostic to what we do with it. So if if the new flavors, you know, everything uh, with cheese in it or mushroom in it is what appeals, try it with the traditional rice. I'm not saying that we have to. Now we have this very interesting baker who buys black rice from us and incorporates it into his sourdough bread. How much better can it get? So if sourdough bread is the thing which everybody loves and he's integrating, incorporating black rice into it. Okay, that's interesting. So I heard of red rice. Uh, for me, this is, uh, when I was two days old when I uh, <laughs> got to know that this black rice. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and black rice uh, has become so popular. Right now, there is black rice in the pressure cooker. <laughs> no, black rice has become very common. Uh, not common, I should say, but it, it has become very popular over the, over the last two to three years. And it was called the forbidden rice. There are many varieties of uh, black rice. But at some point, it has come from Burma and, and other parts of uh, Southeast Asia. And essentially, that has got I mean, medicinal properties and you can actually incorporate it into various traditional foods that we've had uh, here. Karupu Kauni is the name, Tamil name for it. But uh, yeah, you can. So um, I don't know whether Devi can actually show the rice. So she's gone to actually pick up the rice. So, uh, so this is what, you know, so with, with but to Devi's point, it is not, uh, we are not trying to say that, no, no, stick to only traditional Indian food. Our, we are open to open to other cultures, right? So we eat uh, Southeast Asian preparations like a curry laksa or things like that, right? Malaysian food. But we can also have uh, paella, as she said, or risotto, the Italian risotto we could have. All these things are possible with our own traditional rices. So there is no no need to kind of uh, you know skimp on saying oh I'll eat only rice that is the way my ancestors ate. No, it's not required. We are not asking for that. Yeah. So here I think. Um, yeah, sure. Oh, okay. This is yeah. uh, black rice. It becomes purple in color when cooked. Aha. Uh -huh, okay. So this one is new for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you make fantastic. You can make ghee and some. Uh, Rock and sugar, if you like, it mm -hmm. makes fantastic payasam or kheer, okay. and uh, you can have it as uh, as, as kanji. It becomes it's a very nice. And then uh, rice balls, you can make a rice ball with you know the buddha ball kind of thing with kabuli chana on one side, mm -hmm. or sauteed tomatoes, blitz tomatoes. You can uh, you can have it? I mean, we had it as a ball with avocado and uh, tomatoes and kabuli. You can just do so many things. Yeah, so many. But now the wonderful part of it is we actually converted this into idiom. Mm, okay. <laughs> and we had black idiom. We made black gold. Which is like the... fantastic. Like I have never seen black idiom. Idiom has always been black. I mean, what? white. Uh, I think isn't it some you make it with idli and dosha also you add. We did. Uh, we did uh, idli dosha with black rice. We did uh, uh, Kolkata. Paniyaram is a Tamil thing. Uh, mm. And the idiopam. So, and then of course the bread where uh, the baker is making bread with it. So, so many things, so many things can be done. So the uh, the the motto or the, the message that we kind of want to talk about is it's not just about being safe, uh, organic and chemical free and all that. That's a serious stuff. But even if you're not that serious, there is need to celebrate food. Mm. celebrate food, the food that we have, particularly in India, the kind of varieties we have, we have to celebrate food. We are so blessed that we have so many varieties and so much of things that we... Imagine the amount of varieties of dishes that we make. I mean, you are in Bangalore, in Canada, uh, dishes are so fantastic compared... I mean, uh, uh, and so is Tamil dishes, so is Kerala dishes. Or, uh, or anyway, the kind of rich heritage, the kind of rich heritage we carry it is amazing. And here I was working in a, a multinational company in, in Netherlands where all my colleagues used to ask me, okay, you don't eat beef, you don't eat pork, you don't eat chicken or eggs. So what do you eat? So they're kind of blank. <laughs> I said, you please yeah. come with me, visit my home in, in India and you will see what we eat. We don't need to touch any of these animal products and we can have a wonderful, wonderful life celebrating each and every day. So it's like Diwali every day for us. 
right we have so much uh, so much of uh, uh, white rice i mean the, the black rice brown rice so many varieties uh, just fantastic and millets and wheat wheat is another story altogether huh? we are not <laughs> we are not even got there amazing so i i second you on that uh, feeling that you know uh, i've had also colleagues from you know germany ask me the same thing I, how is that you are able to get new things <laughs> uh, on your plate every day and then we we stuck with the same uh, you know yeah. same rotation of stuff yeah and uh, amazing so you know one one uh, question that uh, generally is associated with organic farming is that it is costly so you you in in our previous conversation is you said your aim is to make it affordable and basically uh, reach more and more uh, normal everyday individuals so how's that journey and uh, you know how how does this this cost versus uh, you know need come into picture yeah so we believe that organic food the way it is sold right now and this thing is is the real cost of food the real cost of food and what we compare it with the regular food which is available in the market feel is costly and that is because the regular regular food is highly subsidized by the government so be it fertilizer subsidy that the farmers get the pesticide subsidy the farmers get the farmers get benefit of you know storage for their grains the storage is run by fci and many other go downs are available at very cheap cost uh they get a lot of other benefits which organic farmers don't get yeah. and the scale and the scale of organic farming is still small we have not reached a point where we could truck tons of food here and there so that has not happened so an organic farming by nature if you look at a vegetable farmer he will have at least 7 10 varieties of vegetables growing in his 2 to 3 acre farm he is not going to put five acres of tomatoes and then get it harvested in one go sprayed pesticide sprayed one go it's not going to happen it because that's not how organic works so there are certain elements which government has thanks to government policies of an, in a democracy the governments will always tend to make food cheap so that the population is happy so and they get voted back again and again so that is one part of it that there's politics there but the other aspect of it is that organic farming the uh, is the real cost of farming without any of these external things and then we are not even talking about the externalization of environmental costs most of the fa chemical farmers are putting chemicals into the ground water into the soil and who is bearing the cost the healthcare system is bearing the cost and into your bodies and into your bodies and then you are uh, so it is externalizing the cost so if you do a cost analysis you will find that organic food is comparable to your regular food if you take away all these other things but even otherwise this is the theory part of it. practically speaking what we have done in analysis is that if you go completely organic sunil from your rices to spices to oils everything and go completely organic you will end up paying only 7 rupees 50 paisa extra per meal per head oh wow that's that all the affordable yeah so my point is you go to a, a restaurant and have a meal for 80 rupees will you not pay 88 rupees if the whole thing is uh, is organic <laughs> you have to it doesn't make sense otherwise so my 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 so what we say is don't look at it as item by item no that's a mistake most consumers make so i would request your viewers and uh, viewers to actually look at it not look at it that way so you look at 1 kilo of tomato you will get it at 20 rupees the regular ones but if you go by organic tomatoes it be 40 45 rupees so then they say oh it's double the cost so that's not the way to look at it the way to look at it is look at your entire grocery bill for the month because you have to weight the price by quantity no because ultimately you are not buying only tomatoes so you have to see how much of tomatoes are you buying so you have to, once you do that analysis take your entire grocery bill it will come for a four member family it's about 6000 rupees aside from dairy eggs and all that mm -hmm. 6000 rupees for a four member family go completely organic it will be 8500 so 2500 rupees extra but which translates to around 8 rupees per meal per head so our point is 
that that's how you should be looking at it when we went organic in 2005 it was a bigger bill <laughs> our grocery bill was bigger but within two to three months we could just see that yeah we are eating good food and it doesn't really pinch you and as devi keeps saying we are today paying more for petrol than for uh, food <laughs> so we are willing to put uh, you know more, more money into our cars than a four member family so our children's health is a lower priority none of us are reducing the amount we travel because the petrol cost has gone up we are doing the same amount of traveling we are willing to uh, we are not buying cheap spurious petrol to put into our cars we buy the same quality of petrol but we go for cheaper and cheaper food wherever there is a deal we want to so i mean how much do we respect ourselves and our bodies Absolutely. So there is also Very good mindset, good no, so the, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just saying, there's this mindset. No, there are some videos which were going around how uh, the lady actually buys a Louis Vuitton, uh, you know, handbag from a mall paying whatever, 5,000 bucks or whatever, and then gets out and starts arguing for that, with that vegetable vendor for giving that tomato for, you know, three rupees less. <laughs> so that's the mentality that we have to be thinking of. So when it comes to food, don't, Let's not compromise on the quality. You can compromise on quality of everything, but this is something that you put inside your body. So if you respect your body and that of your children, then I don't think we should be asking this question of price at all. And uh, fundamentally, we all know that nothing can be cheap and best. It can either be cheap or best. So there is, you know, when we expect to buy cheap food, we have to know that we are getting far from the best. Because nobody can afford to grow it cheap for you. Absolutely. And we can't blame the person who's growing it. I mean, people say, why do farmers put these chemicals? Let us remember that it's hurting them more than it's hurting us. I mean, there is a massive health crisis in rural India among farming communities. A lot of them are developing diabetes and blood pressure and other issues. There, there are studies. Which, yeah, their livestock is falling sick. Many women mm -hmm. cannot, I mean, in our village, there's a lot of vegetable cultivation. And many of them cannot work in their vegetable patches because there's so much pesticide spraying that the women are facing massive allergies. Mm. So it's a huge crisis which we are not seeing. So where the cheaper we get food, uh, the it's far from being the best in terms of health, in terms of environmental impact, in terms of farmer impact. We are just being part of the problem. We just have to waste less, prioritize, and buy the right kind of food. <laughs> and you can do that at Biobasics. <laughs> <laughs> or any organic store. I mean, find your own, you know, another organic store nearby. We have no objection, but go no, organic. What, what we say is ask questions. What we say is when you, when you leave your children for uh, education, uh, give them education, you go for a school or a college, you ask 100 questions. You go meet the principal, you will go meet the teacher, you go visit the school, you will do all that. Why don't you do that about food? <laughs> Interesting. I mean, that's something that you feed your children day in and day out. And unfortunately, we are getting into a crisis of a generation where our children are going to be less healthy than us. And yeah. we are less healthy than our parents. Absolutely. And even though our lifespans are you know, on, on paper increasing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Quality of life is decreasing. Yeah. Very... Like, like uh, you know, it's 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 been fifty five minutes of uh, us chatting, <laughs> and you said you have gone for hours. <laughs> you are, yeah, I'm uh, not sure yeah. if your podcast can handle this. <laughs> I, I I am sure uh, that you know uh, after listening to this, uh, my viewers are going to be asking for more, and they're uh, going to come back to you. There were a lot of questions, uh, you know, that I still had. Uh, you know, basically, I did see some of your LinkedIn posts. Uh, being from a corporate guy, uh, you know, this is Jamkana GPD at the end of the year review on a Jamkana and <laughs> or something that really was like, wow, uh, <laughs> this is something that needs to uh, basically be inculcated in a lot of other companies. Uh, right. And uh, you also had shared that you got into social entrepreneurship early in your uh, 40s and then you're, you know, uh, now in your early 50s. And people ask you, uh, are you too old to get into this? So there were a lot of questions. I think I still uh, wanted to start, uh, you know, really get some answers from you, get your views and viewpoints. We can make this a series, Sumil. 
Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we can do sequels. We can do sequels because it's it's important. Uh, absolutely. To, and for all of us, uh, generally, as to yeah. where food is coming from, where am I consuming it? Um, and then I think at a general sustainability level, we should know where it is coming from and what struggle that people go through to for uh, for me and you to have a plate of rice. Uh, yeah. Uh, what, what's the struggle that actually uh, yeah. behind the scenes? Yeah. Because I think we as a generation are uh, so alienated, blinded. I don't know uh, what what's the right word. Uh, to actually see what what's really happening, and then we when we see things in at a more fundamental and a, at a personal and a visceral level, we're gonna say, okay, wow, I didn't know this. Uh, you know that that that's when the real uh, you know uh, it 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 reality hits us, and then we come back to say, okay, uh, I am ready to change, that I am at least okay to ask that question. Right. So. You said you had a hard hard cut off at eleven, so that's why I am like okay. <laughs> Putting... no, we can we can always continue later. Uh, I'm yes. happy to. We both of us are happy to join. Uh, like I said, we are diehard evangelists, so we can we can keep going for hours. Uh, but we seriously thank you for for taking uh, the time, the energy to to host us and uh, to bring this concept to many of your viewers and listeners. I, we really thank you for that, and I think it's great to see youngsters like you and all your viewers and uh, the listeners uh, to listen to this and uh, spread the word. Uh, is what I say. The typical evangelist would say, "Spread the word." <laughs> Amazing. So I've uh, actually had a real, real good time. So I got to uh, see from myself what black rice is. <laughs> you know, right. yes. no problem. <laughs> many varieties and what can you do with that. Uh, very I'm sure that's going to be the first time on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I can also market it. Come, <laughs> come, come see for yourself what black rice is about. <laughs> uh, so thank you for your time uh, and, and uh, you know, jumping on and, and uh, really sharing with uh, me and my listeners as to what uh, you are doing, what is that you stand for sure. and all of your adventures, uh, you know, from from Netherlands, getting here, uh, donning uh, donning a waste and getting on three buses and getting to your farm. <laughs> so that that's a separate podcast, I guess in itself. Sure, there you go. Yeah, it's a separate topic already. Yes. So thank you, Ramesh. Thank you, Devi, for uh, great you. podcast, and I've enjoyed it absolutely thoroughly. Same here. Same, Same here. here. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.